Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Haynes. I work on the, Flux, uh, the BioFlux project at Fluxion Biosciences. And it's my uh, pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Chris Pepper from uh, Brighton uh, and Sussex Medical School. Uh, Professor Pepper's published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers and um, from what I could tell has had over 4,000 citations. His primary research focus is on uh, chronic um, leukocytic, is it leukocytic uh, lymphoma? Or I'm sorry, lymphocytic leukemia. Um, my CLLs have gotten a little um, off there. Uh, th this is one of the most common uh, forms of leukemia in adults that has close to a million um, uh, new patients every year. And uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Pepper. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you over the next sort of 35, 40 minutes about uh, how we've been using a Bioflux 200 to uh, allow us to investigate the effects of blocking 62L or L-selectin on uh, these leukemia cells that Brian introduced uh, and, their, and how that modulates their interaction with vascular endothelium. So the outline of my talk, uh, I'm basically going to talk to you a little bit about what CLL is, what chronic lymphocytic leukemia is, and particularly around uh, the role of the tumor microenvironment in driving the pathology of this disease. And then just briefly explain why we're interested in the trafficking of leukemic B cells um, and why we're interested, therefore, in the role of 62L or L selectin. And then our attempts to try and target 62L with a blocking antibody called DREG56. Uh, of course, the, the main focus of this webinar is to, uh, to demonstrate to you how we've uh, developed an assay using the Bioflux to model tumor endothelial cell interactions. And then finally, just briefly show you some data on how we're combining 62L inhibition with uh, the BTK inhibitor, Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor in Brutinib. So uh, just briefly then, our evolving view of what CLL is. So chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a disease of mature looking B cells. Um, it's the most common adult leukemia in the Western world. And therefore, from my perspective anyway, the most important leukemia in the Western world. And despite recent advances in treatment of which Ibrutinib is one of the principal players, it remains an incurable disease. And we now understand that the accumulation of these leukemic uh, B cells is caused both by intrinsic defects in the tumor cell itself, but also extrinsic uh, factors that impact upon the ability of the tumor cell to die when challenged with chemotherapy. We also understand now um, that CLL is a much more proliferative disease than we previously uh, believed. And I should fess up here that I've been working on CLL for 25 years. And when I first started working on this disease, it was regarded as a lymphoaccumulative disease rather than a lymphoproliferative disease. We now understand that this tumor is actually growing really fast. So about 1% of the tumor turning over every single day. So, but, but we also know that these tumor cells only divide in very specific niches. So in the lymphoid tissues, uh, in what would in normal B cell biology be regarded as germinal centers. And these niches provide additional survival signals to the CLL cells that of course inhibit their apoptotic responses to drugs and therefore lead to residual disease post-treatment and relapse uh, in the context of therapy. So there are, there are three CLL tumor microenvironments that we might describe. The, the first uh, perhaps is, a, is the bone marrow microenvironment, which we now know pr predominantly plays a, uh, a pro-survival role in this disease. So cells traffic there and they can hide out in that bone marrow niche where they are cytoprotected but they do not proliferate to any great extent. 
The other tissue environment, the lymphoid niche, is where the action takes place, if you like. The CLL cells grow and divide in that microenvironment. And then you have this central niche called the vascular niche, which I think up until recently people regarded as being a rather um, boring transit zone between these two more interesting solid tissue microenvironments. I'd like to try and convince you today that that vascular niche is anything but a boring transit zone. In fact, understanding how tumor cells interact in that vascular niche is probably critical to our, to our ability to effectively interact with this disease and bring about uh, effective responses to drugs and hopefully with curative intent down the line. So, Trafficking between these microenvironments appears to be able to modulate the, the natural pathology of the disease. And if you think back to what I just said to you about where these tumor cells uh, actually proliferate, this makes sense. So if the tumor cells are reluctant, for want of a better term, to uh, transendothelially migrate from the vasculature into the lymphoid niche where they will proliferate, then that disease will probably be relatively self-limiting. And this is something that we observe in this disease. It's, it's an incredibly heterogeneous disease when it comes to uh, clinical response or clinical outcome. Some patients have their disease for 25, 30 years without ever requiring treatment, um, and their disease is completely indolent. They die of old age, not of leukemia, whereas other patients have a much more aggressive disease that actually should not be called a chronic leukemia at all. They usually succumb to their disease within two years of diagnosis, which you know, is probably as bad as any acute leukemia uh, that is currently uh, seen in clinical practice. So trafficking is really important, but why is it important? Well, one of the things that we're starting to understand through next-gen sequencing is that it's really only when the cells proliferate that they accumulate additional genetic hits that drive the clonal evolution of the disease. And this is some old school CGH array here, um, just illustrating the point really. These are cells derived from a lymph node of a real patient. And you can see big whole scale losses and gains in genetic material, um, and maybe for another day, but actually many of these losses and gains are focused at telomeric ends of the chromosomes. Um, but that's for another day. But essentially targeting the trafficking of these CLL cells may well be a useful therapeutic strategy for maybe turning more aggressive disease into a more indolent disease with a view that we can maybe uh, more effectively treat the whole of the disease by trapping it in the vasculature. So we've been thinking about how best to do this and, and it's not just my lab that's been doing this, it's a preoccupation of many labs around the world and we're starting to see drugs in the clinic that are really doing this uh, and ibrutinib is one of those drugs. So let's get back to 62L, L-selectin. What is it? Well, it's an adhesion molecule. Um, it promotes the tethering and rolling of uh, lymphocytes, not just CLL cells, but normal B and T lymphocytes too, uh, in the context of extravasation. So it facilitates lymphocytes to traffic out of, lymph, uh, out of the vasculature and into the tissues. Really importantly, from our perspective, we've shown that it's overexpressed on CLL cells compared to normal B cells. So we wanted to ask the question, okay, is there potential to use this molecule as a therapeutic target? So we, uh, we have access to this 62L blocking antibody called DREG56, very uh, quaintly titled. We do that in science an awful lot, don't we? But um, essentially what we did was we took this antibody and we looked to see first off whether blocking 62L had any effect on the apoptosis of the cells in culture. So these are monoculture cells, so basically grown in static uh, tissue culture dishes in the laboratory. And I think you can see from the flat line here that um, 
the addition of the DREG antibody had absolutely no effect on the viability of CLL cells after 24 hours in monoculture. Conversely, what we showed was we really did have on-target effects of this antibody. So the antibody was effectively masking the 62L epitope. Um, so our antibody against 62L, our, our detection antibody against 62L could not bind to its epitope in a dose-dependent fashion. So we have an antibody here that really can do what it says on the tin. It will block 62L, but it doesn't appear to kill CLL cells. So we then went on to look at uh, the ability of um, the, the antibody to block migration in transwell chambers. So these are, I'm sure most of you are familiar with these, but these are essentially static um, inserts in a 24-well plate where you essentially layer the, the uh, leukemia cells onto the top of the trans well and have some kind of um, stimuli to make the cells want to migrate across the, the barrier. In this case, it was uh, SDF1 or CXCL12 in new money, um, which we used in the basal lateral chamber of these uh, wells in order to promote migration. And I think, although th there was some variation uh, in our assay in terms of uh, whether the antibody promoted or otherwise migration, um, that the net outcome is that our conclusion was that under these static conditions, our DREG antibody didn't have any significant effect on the migration capacity of uh, CLL B cells. So, the next question, and I guess we're getting to the money part of the talk now around the bioflux. So what happens when we put CLL cells under shear force? Because if you think back to uh, the, the role or the function of 62L, in static cultures, maybe uh, the ability of CLL cells to migrate would be completely independent of 62L because its role, its primary role in the vasculature is essentially like a cellular grappling hook. So as the cells are whizzing through blood vessels, essentially 62L interacts with its ligand, which is called PNAD, uh, expressed on endothelial cells, and essentially arrests the cells on the vascular wall. So this is where we, this is why we want to model uh, this sort of vascular uh, leukemia cell interaction under shear stress. So getting to the Bioflux 200. So we use a 24 well plate format. Um, essentially, so you have uh, two inlets and one outlet port or well for each uh, experiment. So you can run eight parallel experiments. It's, it's a really cool setup. Um, and essentially, I'm going to talk you through our our endothelial cell um, set up in a little bit more detail on the next slide, but essentially on this pictorial representation here in the bottom right hand corner, essentially what we did was uh, lay down some uh, endothelial cells, in this case Huvex, um, and allowed them to adhere and spread and then line up under shear force before we then introduced our CLLB cells. So in terms of the setup for the Bioflex, and you know, if anybody is interested beyond the end of this seminar, you, you of course can contact me by email um, and I'll be able to give you any more experimental details that you need. But essentially, as I said, these 24 well plate wells were coated with fibronectin. And we essentially introduced 100 microliters per channel. Um, uh, so adding to the O well or the, out, the output well, um, and then applying transiently five dyne just to get it um, zipping between the input and the output wells. So we then washed, uh, after one hour of fibronectin coating, we then washed off the excess using our Huvec specific media, this M199 media, did a couple of washes, which was added to the two input wells, so A and B. And then Huvex cells were pulsed into the channels um, and allowed to adhere. So these channels in between the input and output wells. So we allowed the Huvex to adhere for two hours. 
So no Shia at this point. Um, and of course, one of the ways, one of the important things to remember about setting up these bioflex plates is that you need to balance the media. Otherwise, uh, you can run into a, a little bit of difficulty. So in, we added the uh, Huvex into um, the O, uh, the output well, um, and then balance the media with 25 microliters into A and B. So after we allowed the Huvex to adhere for a couple of hours, we then flowed the M1, uh, M199 media over the cells uh, overnight. So you can see already this is quite a long-winded setup, but hopefully you'll agree that the results were worthwhile. So we only use 0.5 dyne per centimeter squared um, of shear stress, but it's enough. What we're trying to do here is make the, encourage the endothelial cells to line up just like they would in, in a, a real blood vessel, um, ready to receive uh, our cells. So in the following day, we check for courage, coverage of the endothelial cells and alignment. Um, so using the microscope, obviously, and then we stimulate the cells with TNF. So why do we do that? Well, we want to try and encourage the interaction of the lymphocytes with the endothelium. So inflaming the endothelium with TNF actually does that really very nicely. In addition to, the addition, uh, to uh, adding TNF, we also add uh, CXCL12. Now, rather interestingly, when we stain our endothelial cells um, after treating with SDF1 or CXCL12, you don't see uniform coverage of CXCL12. What you find is that you get hot spots of SDF1, CXCL12 on these endothelial cells. And what we think is happening there is it act, they, they form almost like foci for the cells to actually congregate around. Once that initial uh, sticking has taken place with 62L, you then get rolling and, it, and actually they roll towards these SDF1 hotspots. So finally, we add the CLL cells into the A and B ports with or without our CD62L uh, blocking antibody. And we flow those over the endothelium, again at 0.5 dyne per centimeter squared. Um, so initially though, we uh, crank up the shear force just to encourage the cells to move, to flow from the wells into the channels. Okay. So the final thing just to talk about here is the setup of the time-lapse camera. Um, so you need, re if you want to track this sticking and rolling uh, phenomena on the Bioflex, you need to be using um, a pretty fast setting for uh, acquisition of images. So we basically set it to the fastest uh, sequential image collection that it would do, for our camera at least, um, which is 60 sequential images over 8.55 seconds. And finally, then we used the QCapture Pro software to track CLL cells sticking and rolling. So, as I said to you in my previous slide, seeing is believing. So here's a little video. I hope it's going to play for you. But essentially, what you see here, this is on a loop, so we can just let it go forever if we really want to. But essentially, what I want you to take away from this is most of the uh, CLL B cells, these blue and yellow flashes uh, going across the screen, are not interfacing at all with the, with the endothelial cells, which you can see adhered very neatly to the bottom of this channel, microfluidic channel. But what you can see is some of the CLL lymphocytes, and one of the best examples on this particular image is circled here in the red circle. You can see the CLL B cells essentially sticking down and then rolling along at a much slower pace. Okay, so I think um, having the blue and yellow flashes going past the screen really does illustrate just how powerful 62 ligand is in terms of mediating that initial sticking event um, under shear stress. So what we can do then is using uh, the, the software, we can actually track 
the movement of individual cells over that 8.55 second time, uh, time frame. And of course, you can do multiple uh, events, so, so track multiple cells moving at the same time. Uh, and this image graphically illustrates exactly what I've just said. So then we can look at the tracks. So we can look at how many tracks are produced. So in other words, only cells that stick initially and then roll will be regarded, will, will generate a track because every other cell will just simply whiz through at that high speed that I showed you in the video and will not register with the software. So the cell needs to have arrested and started to roll in order for these tracks to become visible and, and trackable using the software. So we can count the number of tracks and I think you can see here that when we introduce the DREG antibody, you get this dose dependent effect on the number of tracks produced. So it looks very much like the DREG antibody is modulating the ability of the CLL cells to uh, instigate that initial sticking on the endothelium. So a consequence of that is that um, those cells that do stick also reduce their velocity. So this is again, this talking about velocity here, we're not talking about changing the velocity of the cells flowing past in our video at really high speed with no interaction with the endothelium at all. This is the velocity of the CLL cells that have arrested and are therefore rolling. Um, and the consequence, I think the way I interpret this is that we are not inhibiting all of the um, possible epitopes for uh, binding of PNAD using our DREG antibody, but the inhibition of at least some of those uh, ligand receptor interactions is enough to propel the cells quicker along our endothelial uh, surface. And this is basically graphically illustrated here. We get the, the length of the track that we end up with because the cells are moving quicker, the length of the track over that 8.55 second time interval is significantly longer when we treat the cells with DREG than cells that have uh, not been treated with the CD62L antibody. So I'm going to go away from the, uh, the Bioflex just for a moment and uh, just introduce to you another model that we've developed in my lab, which is a more macro model, um, which allows recirculation, just like you might find in a patient. Um, this is a essentially a, a, a modified bioreactor. Um, and actually the guy that developed this bioreactor thought that I was completely mad when I proposed what I said to him I wanted to use this instrument for. Uh, because historically these bioreactors have been used to grow endothelium, but they've been seeded on the outside of the hollow fibers in the, in the bioreactor cartridge. So they, the hollow fibers are perfused along their length by tiny pores, they're actually between 0.1 and 0.2 micron, the pores in these hollow fibers, um, and the endothelial cells were historically grown on the outside of those and perfused by new media in the reservoir. What I proposed to do was actually introduce the endothelium into the lumen of the hollow fibers, so the inside of the hollow fiber, um, and try to create pseudo blood vessels. Um, and I think, yeah, John thought that I was completely barbie when I proposed this to him, but of course he sold me a system and off we went. And Beth, uh, this is Beth here, she actually made this system work. So she brought my mad ideas to life. So this is an electron micrograph um, cut through in a transverse section through a hollow fiber. And I think you can see this is, this is on the inside of the hollow fiber. So you can see that we've got endothelial cells that have stuck down on the inside of the hollow fiber. This is just after one hour of exposure to endothelial cells. And then 24 hours later, we take another uh, section in a different cartridge 
and I think you can see that the, the whole of the lumen of the vessel is starting to be covered by these endothelial cells that have spread completely, covering the hollow fibre. And you can see here that the, the micro pores in the hollow fibre, in the, in the backing to these endothelial cells, these flattened endothelial cells. So importantly, when we harvested those endothelial cells from uh, one of these cartridges, we, we actually saw some of the characteristic changes that we would see in endothelium when uh, they're grown under shear force. So you saw a down regulation of VCAM1, PCAM1, ICAM1 and VEGFR2, just like you would from a uh, in vivo blood vessel. So at least at, on that level, we felt that we had a model that was recapitulating to some extent uh, the patient microenvironment of the vasculature. We published this, uh, this model in blood. Uh, we've subsequently published a few more papers using the same model. And I'm pleased to say that a few other uh, hardy souls have actually started to use this model themselves. It's not the simplest model in the world. Um, but going back to uh, you know, 62L, in our model system, when we introduced CLL cells into the model, what we showed was that um, 62 ligand, or 62L, sorry, um, I keep calling it ligand, it's, of course it's 62 leukocyte uh, expression on the surface of these cells um, actually goes up in a time dependent fashion. Um, and this is modulated um, very much by shear force. So the shear force actually promotes the expression of this uh, receptor on the surface of the CLL cells, um, making them perhaps more amenable to um, that sort of sticking and rolling that we observed in our bioflux. Of course, it's not the only phenotypic change that occurs in these cells. We also see big, uh, big increases in the chemokine receptor, CXCR4, um, in CD5, which is uh, sort of the marker that defines CLL really, because B cells wouldn't normally express CD5, um, but we do see an increase in CD5 on uh, CLL cells. And also this integrin, CD49D, which in previous work we've shown to be very important in, uh, as a prognostic marker or a predictive biomarker of uh, disease in, uh, in CLL. So um, if we think about our macro uh, system now, we take CLL cells, and as I said, you see this big increase in 62L, 62L expression. And when we added DREG um, to our macro system, we saw a, a reduction in 62L expression, but this was not significant. Uh, this is at N equals six, this experiment. Even though the reduction in 62L wasn't significant, what we showed was that uh, at the 24 hour time point, we showed a reduction in the percentage of cells that migrated in our model. So again, sort of going back to the Bioflex data, this corroborates what we found, that you know, the, the inability of the cells to interact with endothelium is probably modulating their ability to migrate. So, I'm getting towards the end now, but essentially we then wanted to ask the question, well, does ibrutinib, this drug that is, has transformed the treatment of CLL patients, um, modulate 62L expression? And the reason why we asked that question is that one of the very unexpected um, effects of ibrutinib, the, the drug company that developed this, uh, Johnson & Johnson had no idea that this was going to occur. What, one, of the, one of the effects it has is that it appears to promote tissue redistribution. So patients have lymph node involvement and those lymph nodes rapidly shrink when they're treated with ibrutinib and that leads to a lymphocytosis. So the, the, the number of tumour cells in the peripheral blood of these patients increases quite significantly. And I'm sure, in fact, I know that the, the, the early clinical trials that were conducted on ibrutinib made the, uh, the clinicians very nervous because 
they actually thought that they were making the disease worse when they treated their CLL patients with this, uh, this drug. Because like I say, the tumor appeared to be growing because there was an increase in the peripheral vasculature. So we wanted to ask the question, well, is ibrutinib modulating 62L and, there, and thereby blocking the egress of CLL cells from the peripheral vasculature back to the lymphoid tissues? And indeed, that appears to be what is happening here. So 62L expression um, in the context of ibrutinib treatment, there's a dose dependent reduction in 62L on the surface. And I haven't got time to go into it today, but we've explored the mechanism of this quite uh, substantially now. This is not a transcriptional uh, impact on 62L. It appears to be um, promoting the shedding of 62L from the surface of the CLLB cells. Um, and going back to our Bioflex, what we showed was when we treated CLL cells with ibrutinib, we saw a significant, well, almost significant reduction in the number of tracks produced. So ibrutinib was giving us a rather similar response to uh, our DREG antibody. So then we thought, OK, well, can we combine these and see a, 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 an additive or synergistic effect? And it certainly appears from our preliminary data that the combination of ibrutinib and DREG does have a significant uh, inhibitory effect on the number of CLL cells that can arrest in our Bioflux model system. Um, so we might argue that in the future, targeting both uh, targeting CLL cells with both ibrutinib and the 62L inhibitor um, may well actually promote uh, improved outcomes for CLL patients. So. I've talked for long enough, I think, um, so we'll obviously open the, the floor to some questions, but in conclusion, um, we've shown that inhibiting 62L's function is not toxic to CLL cells, but it does inhibit CLL sticking and rolling using both our Bioflex and our more macro model system. This inhibits the migration of CLL cells or the extravasation of these cells. And so we conclude that 62L is a valid target for therapy in CLL, and particularly because it shows promise in combination with ibrutinib. So it just remains for me to acknowledge the work uh, of the people in the lab who did most of the, uh, the data, generated most of the data that I presented for you today. So Beth is a, a very talented postdoc in my lab. Chris Fagan is our uh, clinician uh, who provided all of the clinical material. Claire Shear was uh, a medical student who uh, did quite a bit of the Bioflux uh, analysis as part of uh, a summer project. And Joe Jones is our uh, lab tech. So thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chris. That's a re remarkable um, amount of data that you showed. Um, I've got a question that came in about forming the monolayers. It was it was more of a um, uh, nitty gritty type of question, but can you speak at all to the the condition of the Huvex that you use, um, the concentration, and even what the passage number is or or maximum passage number that you would yep. use for for making a Huvex monolayer? So let's take those in turn then, Brian. So in, so the the number of Huvex that we introduce to uh, each channel. Um, is about 10 to the 5 endothelial cells. So quite a lot of endothelial cells. Not all of them stick. Um, so you end up washing quite a few of them away. Um, but we found with trial and error that about 10 to the 5 cells uh, in that 100 microliter um, deposition volume gives you the maximum number of uh, uh, stuck endothelial cells. So moving on then to um, passage number. Well, what we've done with these, uh, I mean, as you can probably appreciate, we grow a lot of endothelial cells. So we've got these double-decker, um, you know, uh, huge 
um, tissue culture flasks growing with endothelium in them all the time. And Jo actually spends a lot of her life passaging endothelial cells. Um, so what we decided to do was um, we, we actually immortalized our, H, our, our HUVEX. So we've, we've actually introduced TERT into these HUVEX because what we found was that um, more than 10 passages of a, uh, an untransformed HUVEC was essentially the end of its usefulness. So the, the endothelial cells start to uh, lose the classic phenotypic signatures of HUVEX, but they also just refuse to stick down. Um, so in, in an attempt to try to uh, rationalize um, the, the purchase of HUVEX cells, for the lab for these models and we turted them and that seems to have done a really phenomenal job um, so we can now actually grow these cells for maybe 20 25 passages without them losing any of their endothelial like nature was that viral sorry was it viral you said you turted them um, you added the um yeah the yeah yeah yeah, so we added telomerase uh, using a, a viral vector. Yeah, lentivirus. All right. Um, it, as I look at this, um, I mean, you talked about a couple small molecules. Do you think there's an opportunity to, to set this up as a, a, a sort of a medium throughput screening platform for other modulators of either uh, L-selectin or, um, or other targets related to CLL? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fairly low throughput model, if I'm being truthful, um, because, you know, as you probably grasp from the, the, the setup slide that I showed, it's a fairly um, convoluted process to get the set the, the, the Bioflex ready to receive the cells. But, you know, yeah, once you've got it up and running, I mean, like I say, you've got essentially eight experiments on a 24 well plate. So you could, you know, run two or three of those a day, no problem at all. So yeah, you could you could use it as a as a medium throughput screening tool, I guess. And I know that um, you know the mechanism of Keytruda isn't necessarily to to adhesion of um, to the endothelium, but <laughs> it, it, is there a possibility of, of using this model to to figure out a little bit of why? Keytruda only works on about 30% of the patients that it, it, it touches? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's true of quite a lot of small molecule inhibitors. Um, and in fact, to be honest with you, Brian, I think one of the things that I'm toying with the idea of doing at the moment, um, I didn't show you any data today, but this model, you can actually, you can show extravasation using this model. So I've got some videos where you actually see the, uh, the lymphocyte burrowing underneath the endothelial cell is pretty cool but one of the things that um we're we're thinking about of course there's a there's been this explosion in cell-based therapeutics um particularly car t cells so but one of the issues that we that uh, those cars have particularly in solid tumors is their inability to actually get to the site of the tumor um so I think we could actually use, use the Bioflex to look at the fitness of T cells, their ability to burrow under the endothelial layer and then transendothelially migrate. And, and that might be something really useful for the future. But I think any of these um, biomolecules, you know, yeah, you could potentially look at the mechanism of action and whether individual patients have differential responses to them using this type of setup. Well, again, it's a remarkable um, body of work. Um, thank you again. The, this webinar will be um, put online. Anything else you, you want to add, Chris? Well, only just to say, Brian, I, di I did say it during the middle of my talk, but you know, if people want the a more detailed protocol about how we set the Bioflex up to do this type of assay. I mean, bearing in mind that, okay, we're using it for leukemia cells, but you could use this for normal B and T lymphocytes in just the same way. Um, we've done that. So we know that this system works, you know, with normal B and T cells rather than malignant B cells, as, as I showed today. 
anybody wants the protocol, I'm very happy to share it. And um, I probably want to circle back with you later about uh, immortalizing or or lengthening the lifespan of these Huvex cells as well, because that's definitely been a sticking point uh, in, in many labs has been uh, the supply of Huvex and, of course, the um, the reliability of them. So yeah, well, they're expensive cells, you know, so you're talking about a thousand quid to buy an aliquot of uh, cells that, you know, usually under normal circumstances really only have maybe half a dozen to 10 passages of useful life, you know, well, we've doubled that at least now with the turt, um, the turting of these cells. That, that's phenomenal. I, um, you know, at one point I, I visited a lab in Spain that was hooked up to a, um, a maternity ward and right. they had, um, it would seem like almost a factory where uh, they would get the umbilical cords, a technician would take and roll them and, and do the, the literal massaging of, of the umbilical cord and then had probably some of the freshest Huvex I've ever seen. But the reality is most people have to buy them and it just becomes a, a cost, um, a costly thing. So um, of course it is, yeah. that's, that's a great option. All right. Well, thank you again. And um, in, in the US, um, enjoy your morning in the UK. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. And in, in China, I, Hope you all go back to bed. <laughs>